So hey there fellow YouTubers, Frank Bush here again. In today's video I'm going to be showing a detailed build out of how to run a microwave out of the back of a truck using solar power. So if you're interested in that type of content, stay tuned. I'll go through the full details. All right, well, the first order of business is start getting the bits and bobs out of the vehicle, I guess. So we've got a solar panel. If you've watched previous videos of mine, this is a 175-watt flexible solar panel. I've used this in multiple videos. I'm just going to set that to the side for a minute. All right, so I've got my battery sitting here, and I've got my microwave sitting here and then I've got an inverter that I'm going to need to use to turn the power from the DC in the batteries to the AC that the microwave is going to need so this is a 2000 watt pure sine wave inverter produced by Renogy it's a pretty solid unit I'll shift camera angles and I'll start to walk through the different individual components and how they all work together yeah Okay, so the first order of business, what we'll end up looking at here is the batteries. So these are lithium iron phosphate batteries. I got them from Alberta Lithium um, in Canada, and this is one of the cheapest batteries I found available. And they seem to be uh, fairly solid units, so I'm happy with those. And all I've really done is connected those with um, a parallel connection of number four wire, uh, number four gauge wire. So positive to positive, negative to negative, really simple connection. This unit here is a solar charge unit and it's a PWM charger. So this is designed to take power in from the solar panels and it converts the voltage that comes off the solar panels, which normally sits up closer to 18, uh, 20 volts and it converts it down to roughly around 13 and a half volts which is what these batteries like to be charged at so to give you an idea each one of these batteries they're rated their official ratings if you will are 12.8 volts at 100 amperes so that works out to 1280 watts worth of power that these can hold so together they hold 2560 um, watts so two and a half kilowatts worth of power so that's amply enough power storage to be able to um, power this microwave one of the key things about using the lithium iron phosphate over say like a, a cheaper lead acid battery is that I can hit these really really hard and I can pull a lot of amps off them at one time so these are kind of better suited batteries when it comes to being able to run these larger inverters like the one that I'm going to be showing in this example you know when you're using a sealed lead acid battery battery only about half the capacity of the battery is actually officially quote-unquote usable power and if you draw below about 50% of the battery's capacity with sealed lead acids you can cause damage to those batteries permanently and they'll start to degrade through time whereas with the lithium iron phosphate you can draw them down to pretty well nothing and you're not going to cause any damage so the amount of usable power that exists in these is far greater than it would be in a sealed lead acid and the speed at which you can draw the amps off these over a longer period of time is better so these are really just better suited batteries these are rated for I believe it's about 4,000 cycles for this specific brand but generally speaking lithium iron phosphate batteries you know you can do daily cycled use out of them for about 10 years to give you an idea so I'll see if I can shift camera angles and give you a, a better focus on the solar charge controller and then I've got an extension cable that will just hook the solar panel to the PWM charge controller and we'll start to throw power into the battery because in this uh, video I want to show how to get the power into the batteries and then getting the power out to use through the inverter to run things like microwaves and other things yeah so let me shift camera angles and see if I can get a better angle on this meter here and then uh, we'll plug in the solar panels and we'll start to get these batteries taken a charge okay so now I'll just talk about the uh, solar charge controllers here and try to go through a little bit of detail on these now this is the current voltage in the battery these batteries are pretty full at this point in time but it's 13.4 volts and what we'll see as we go through this is it'll tell me how many kilowatt hours I'm generating from the solar panels and in to the battery I've just wired this up and reset things so it's showing a zero but as you charge from the solar panels it'll tell you exactly how many kilowatt hours you're storing into your battery over time so it's kind of handy in that regard 
and then it'll show the amount of amps because we don't have this hooked up I'll reshow this once it's hooked up and show you the levels but uh, you've got the amount of amps that'll be flowing into the battery you've got the voltage level that the charger will convert down to because it'll adjust the voltage to optimize the charging speed of the battery and then it has the temperature and you can switch that between uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius I don't have the meter hooked up so it's showing it's 25 degrees but in reality it's only about 8 or 10 degrees out here and the these are really simple units really there's a black and a red wire that run off um, as the battery positive and negative that come out of this unit and as you can see I've hooked it onto the positive of the battery and the negative of the battery so it's fairly straightforward in that regard and uh, really this is just simple units they just optimize the voltage and amps and everything so that uh, you can charge up the batteries as optimally as possible so I'll shift camera angles I'll hook up the connections to the solar panel and we'll start throwing a charge then I'll come back and show exactly how many amps and stuff are going in here so you're not just seeing all zeros yeah so like I say it's really simple I've got the MC4 connections. Now these are the inputs that go into the solar charge controller. And they've just got these adapters. I'll show you a close-up of those. That's the male end and the female end. And they literally just plug straight into the solar panels. It's just a way to give you kind of an extension cord to run from the solar charger out to your solar panels. And uh, these are good little easily clippable connections, but they're waterproof and all that kind of happiness. So it makes it really simple. To turn around and extend wires and that type of thing so like i say fully waterproof and everything else these can sit out in all weather no issues so i'll take the other end and just hook those onto the solar panels now yeah okay so now i'll just take those the other end of the cable there and now on the solar panel it's got a matching set if you will there's my female i simply plug in the male and i do the same with this male into this female and i'm plugged in and i'm taking a charge now I've just kind of put the solar panels in this position because the angle of the sun in my location and that kind of thing makes it that I can get half decent sun on this panel just sitting it right where it is. But uh, I'll zoom back in on the solar charge controller and show you the power going into the unit now, yeah? Okay, so I just uh, shifted the solar panel just so I can get better lighting on this little solar charge controller and that way you guys can see it better because I know that this camera can be difficult sometimes at getting good pickup if you will when it comes to little things like this but as you can see you have 13.5 volts coming in at a 2.6 amps so that's throwing charge now into the battery and I haven't produced uh, you know 0.1 of a kilowatt hour if you will so we're not there yet the voltage of the battery is now showing 13.5 which ideally these batteries top out at about 13.6 or so where 13.4 13.5 13.6 that lets you know that the lithium iron phosphates are pretty full so even though I'm taking a bit of charge that's uh, these batteries have really large capacity so they can do that but generally speaking if you're sitting around 13.4 volts you know your battery's pretty close to fully charged so like I say that's just an example of the solar charge controller now and one of the key factors will be really the amps so like I say the volts will shift and optimize to the battery but the amps so it says 2.7 amps here but because I've hooked up to two lithium iron phosphate batteries in this setup that um, if I wanted to kind of work out um, how many amps are going into each you take whatever this amount is so in this point you know it was in say two and a half amps you're only actually putting one and a quarter amps into each battery because there's two of them so it kind of splits the amps across so you know if you're wanting to kind of gauge say this was up to 20 amps uh, 20 amps flowing into the battery that tells me 10 are going into each and from dead to full this would be about 10 hours to to kind of keep the math simple if you will right if, you know uh, if you're wanting to ballpark things and that kind of stuff without getting too techy about stuff that's the easiest way I find to kind of go about things if you will and uh, as you can see the sun's come out a bit more and it's now up closer to 3.6 amps and it'll fluctuate depending on the sun right now there's a bit of haze over the sun so it's kind of slowing things down but this panel at peak performance I've had these panels produce about um, 
9, 10 amps. And normally I'll use two of them together in combination. And there's little MC4 Y connectors where I can hook these up and drive them through this exact setup. And uh, it'll end up handling this. Um, you know, on average, I get closer to about 8 amps each coming off these panels. So on a good sunny day, I can get up to like 16 amps or so flowing in, which is, you know, 8% per hour flowing into this to give you an idea of time. So, you know, dead to full off of a single one of these, I'm looking at about 12 hours off of two of them. It's up closer to six, you know, good ideal conditions and that kind of stuff. But I'll shift gears now, because really the heart of it is, let's get this microwave going so I can make myself a lunch. So I'll shift gears and kind of move things around so that it's easy to show the camera for the next steps, yeah? So, and I'll just show you kind of a, quick close-up of the inverter there's hundreds and hundreds of different types of inverters you can get online and there's lots of them that are good ones you know one of the general rules to go with i find is pick the pure sine wave inverters go with these the modified um, inverters the modified sine waves are junk when it comes to dealing with induction motors and those types of things whereas the pure sine wave motors can work with anything so this specific inverter though can handle as you can see they can handle up to 2000 watts this one specifically is made by Renogy. I find the Renogy quality of stuff is, you know, fairly high quality, so I don't mind it. Now it has a little USB output so I could charge phones and those types of things. You got three AC plugs. This is where you could wire this directly into um, uh, boxes, junction boxes in your um, off-grid cabin or those types of things to feed out to AC power outlets that are plugged into the wall and that type of stuff but I'm not going to go through the full details of that at this point in time but that's kind of what this little component is for on cheaper inverters these things don't normally exist but on the more expensive ones they do where you can have this sitting kind of out of sight out of mind and it's just wired right into the grid within your cabin and that kind of stuff so you know uh, there is videos on details of this and I might touch on that in a future video but at this point I'm just not going to bother and then it's really simple on the back you've got the negative and a positive and they come out to good you know thick terminals and that kind of stuff and they'll simply connect onto the battery of the positive to the negative now one of the things you want to do is you know when you're hooking on these larger um, wattage uh, inverters you want to make sure that um, you turn around and kind of do a pre-charge, they call it. Then, you know, if you're using something below about 2000 watts, it's not really an issue. But when you get up to, you know, these higher wattage inverters, when you go to connect you know, to the positive and the negative, there's capacitors that exist within these inverters and they'll want to kind of soak in the power really quick. And the lithium iron phosphate batteries are really good at kind of putting that power out. So you can get massive sparks across here where it can vaporize the metal and stuff. So in order to kind of counter that, you use resistors where I'll connect the negative on and then when I go to connect on the positive, I'll preemptively put the resistor on the positive and connect it to the battery and allow it to kind of slowly charge up the capacitors that sit in this inverter before I just go hooking it on here. And it allows me to avoid the sparks and that kind of stuff. I'll see if I can get a close up on it where I've touched the inverter straight to the batteries. Like I say, I don't know if the camera's given it justice, but you can see where there's been some damage done to the bolt where it's literally vaporized the metal. And you gotta be really careful when you're doing this. Normally you wear eyewear when you go to connect these inverters on because if there is any spark that comes off this, you know, you don't want little bits of molten uh, metals flying through the air and into your eyeballs, right? That could cause bad days. So either way, I'll kind of shift the camera angles and I'll show how I hook this up so it's uh, safely done and uh, avoiding any type of you know large sparks and that kind of stuff that potentially could do damage right okay so I've got the wires for the inverter just coming into the box now I've got my trusty multi-tool which I use in almost every one of these types of videos and tend to use in a lot of my bushcraft ones as well it really is one of my prime tools out in the world but First order business, I'm just going to hook up my negative terminal and I'll just kind of adjust that back. These wires are pretty thick, so you might find them a little awkward to kind of get lined up to the terminal and that kind of stuff, but you know, such is life. And the thinking really is I'm going to just want to connect 
both the parallel connection to the battery and I'm going to want to connect the inverter off to this terminal. And sorry about the noise in the background. I'm in an urban environment and I try to go to areas that are a little quieter, but people are everywhere in the world, so such is life, right? So you want to make sure that connection's really good and on there of that solid not going anywhere. Now the last thing you want is these connections to be loose in any way. Now, like I was kind of talking about earlier, I've got this little resistor now. This is a 12 volt, 21 watt resistor. And the thinking really is, I'm gonna take that first order business, I'll just loosen this off, because I might as well get the positive connections ready to go. Now, like I say, I wanna pre-charge the, I'll just put that there for a second. I wanna pre-charge the capacitors in the inverter so it doesn't throw huge sparks and you know create any type of risk whatsoever so i'll feed in my positive now now before i go touching that to the terminal because if i do it'll just be chaos i'm gonna turn around and hold one wire end and make sure i'm not really touching the metal per se but i'm going to kind of hold it where i'm touching those two terminals together and i'm going to touch the other wire end just up to the battery and what that allows, hopefully I know the camera isn't that elegant at what I'm doing here, but what that allows is to charge up the capacitors in the inverter without throwing huge sparks and stuff. So it takes a few seconds for that to do that. So I'll just kind of give it a second for it to do what it does. And then after, normally I'll give this say 10, 15 seconds or so. And it just lets me know that, yeah, okay, all the capacitors are fully charged. So when I do connect these terminals together of the positive to the positive on the battery, I'm not going to get those huge sparks. So either way, we should be there now. So I'll just kind of set this resistor to the side and get it out of the way. And now when I touch, there was no spark. So it's far safer to do. And all I'm going to do now is take the bolt and connect all those terminals together, the two of them. Normally you don't want to go beyond having three terminals connected to a battery terminal at any point in time. That's, you know, to stay kind of safe and within compliance and those types of things of electrical standards. That's the general rule of you don't want to have more than three of these connected to one terminal at a time. If you have that situation, you want to go out to bus bars and those types of things. So either way, the inverter's hooked up now. So I'll shift camera angles and we'll flip it on and we'll show you that the power's flowing through that unit, yeah? So like I say, really simple. The positive connected to the positive, negatives connected to the negative. They feed off and run right into the inverter. Nothing complex there. Then now on the inverter side, I was going to use my tripod stand, but I'll just set that to the side for a second. On the inverter side, there's, I can kick off to a remote control. There's remotes that come with these, but right now in the, I'm centered, I'm in the off position. And as soon as I kick that on, you see the lights light up, heard the little beep, lets me know that this unit's good to go. So all I have now to do is to plug the microwave into the inverter and we're off to the races. Like I say, nothing fancy here. So I'll just take the power cord that comes right off the microwave, you know, normal AC plug, and plug that right into the unit. And my microwave is lit up. I'll grab the camera. The clock needs to be set and that kind of stuff, but such is life. Hopefully the camera's picking that up. Got the green lights flickering on there. We're good to run. So at this point in time, I'll stop and get myself my bowl of chili ready because that's going to be part of this example of and just so you're aware of so that's the kind of main core of things and then i just threw the solar panel up on the roof of the truck and that way it's kind of up and out of the way so it made it that i could do this example now if i was you know car camping truck camping if you will of covertly stealth camping out of the back of the vehicle i've got the windows that sit to access the back here I would have those solar panels strapped to the roof and feed the wiring in through those windows and then I would take the battery bank and the microwave and just put it off to one side 
and I would now have full power production, not only to run a microwave, but I've got two other AC terminals here. I could run lights and other things out of this unit, then use this as a mobile power supply. I just use the microwave because it's a large consumer of power. And, you know, to give you an idea, if you're wanting to set this stuff up for off-grid and that kind of stuff, my general recommendations is don't go with anything below a 2000 watt inverter and that way you can run things like microwaves without it being an issue and you can still have a couple lights plugged in at the same time and don't go with anything below about 200 ampere hours at least of the 12 volts you know and when it comes to the solar no i you know normally if this was to be a permanent setup i'd have the solar like i say strapped to the roof and that kind of stuff Given the nature of the kinds of videos I do, I like having those solar panels where I can pop them off and do different examples and everything else. So I haven't mounted them to the roof of my vehicle, but easily could be done, right? So either way, like I say, I'll get my chili together and uh, let's get this microwave. Well, I've hit a horrid reality. I forgot my chili at home. This is tragic. Well, either way, I've got a water supply. If you watch previous videos of mine, I uh, tend to tote around water supply with me. So I've got some water in that container and I just happen to have a root beer jug. So I'll use that to do a microwave just to show you the functioning of the microwave. I'll throw it on two minutes on high to show you I'm not overloading things. And uh, I'll shift camera angles here as well and show you the back of the microwave. And then I'll just fill this up with some water and microwave it off to show you the microwave functioning and that kind of thing. It's really unfortunate. I forgot my lunch. That's tragic. But yeah, let me shift camera angles and I'll show you the back of the microwave and show you how many watts it's pulling, yeah? So I don't know if the camera's picking up the details of that very well or not. Hopefully it is the case. But uh, it says here that the maximum output is 1100 watts um, and uh, water load 275 milliliters but yeah i don't know what to say about that but the interesting reality about microwaves and i i want to kind of state this in this video of you know if you look at your inverter and you think no oh, i had an 1100 watt inverter that's enough to run this microwave that simply isn't the case microwaves are kind of a weird animal that way of you know most devices they turn around and say oh 400 watts and it is 400 watts but in this the maximum output is 1100 watts so the input on this device is closer to 14 or 1500 watts because it uses additional power to turn around and convert it over to be microwave magic if you will through the magnetron so you know that output power of 1100 watts isn't going to be the minimum threshold of the inverter you would need you know if i was running a thousand watt microwave say there's no way I could run that through a thousand watt inverter. It just wouldn't happen. I'd have to be using, you know, a 1500 watt inverter to safely be able to run it for extended periods of time. Just so people are aware of, you know, I, I've seen that mistake made in the past where people turn around and pick up a thousand watt microwave thinking it'll work with a thousand watt inverter. And then the inverter craps out every two seconds and they're not able to run it and then they're disappointed. And then you're into a situation where you're either hunting for microwaves that are less than a thousand watts which normally those are difficult to find and underpowered at best or they're wanting to turn around and buy a more powerful inverter and inverters are hundreds of dollars a piece so it's one of those things where you're better off to buy like i said to me if you're wanting to run this level of application um anything below 2000 watts is really a compromise of you know it's worth the extra money to get the extra wattage so that you can at least run this and be able to run some lights and those types of things and that gives you the ability to cook and run lighting you know heat's a whole separate topic of discussion and it's not really ideal to deal with heat and from electrical to heat that conversion is fairly poor but uh either way i'm just kind of rambling now but that was one of the key things i wanted to mention here was you know it's misleading when it comes to microwaves of the max maximum output wattage isn't necessarily um, what you're looking for to match up to your inverter. That's the key. You always want your inverter to be, you know, a, a half decent amount above what the maximum output is of the microwave to, like I say, ensure that I can run this microwave for five, 10 minutes without it crapping out on me. Yeah.
So either way, I'll kind of shift the microwave back to a better angle. I'll give it a good five minute run just to show that it's not timed out. I won't record the entire five minutes, but I'll record the first few seconds as we get close to the end of the five minutes. I'll show that part too. And I assure you that, you know, this load can easily be run off of that inverter without issue. But uh, yeah, it's just really crappy. I forgot my lunch. That's, that's really unfortunate. <laughs> okay, so I filled up this water bottle hopefully the camera's picking that up it's got about 500 milliliters of uh, fluids into it i'll uh, shift the camera just so i can steady it while i go and set these things and uh yeah all right well let's just get this going so like i say put the water in the microwave and uh i'll set it for five minutes So hopefully the camera's picking up the noise and the microwave's running without issue. Now, my only concern is microwaving that small amount of water, it's probably gonna come to a fierce boil before we even hit the five minutes, but just to show the fact that the inverter isn't gonna pop from having too much wattage run, I'll just let this example run. In fact, what I'll do is see if I can do a time lapse on this. So as we've gotten down to the last 40 seconds or so, I just thought I'd stop and kind of show on the charge controller now and see if I can kind of get that on the angle. Camera's picking that up. Where I'm still throwing the voltage on the battery has dropped down to 12.8 volts because of the load sitting on it. But I'm still taking in 3.3 amps. So I'm still taking a charge from the solar panels at the same point in time that I'm uh, outputting to the microwave, that's really not an issue. And the charge controller will adjust the voltage going into the batteries because of the lower voltage. We're at the point now where the five minutes is up. So, under that premise, whew. Yeah, so there's water boiling, steam and everything, because, you know, this small of an amount of, uh, yeah, I don't even want to touch that, like, wow. But you can see that the water bottle even shrank a little bit from being microwave for two, for that long. But uh, it's one of those things where it did hit a full boil. Like I say, it boiled over in here to the degree where there's now water in my microwave, which is unfortunate. I'll have to drain that out before I pack everything up. But to show you now, I'll go back to the battery and the charge controller in that. Uh, Say, hopefully you can see the voltage on the battery I don't know if the camera's picking that up that great or not but the voltage on the battery one way or the other bounced right back up again after that load to 13.3 volts so there's still lots of capacity that exists within that battery like I say that was a good five minute microwave run you know it's one of those things where uh, it's consuming about 30 watts per minute to give you a ballpark of the the microwave so we just used 150 watts if you will of power out of there so in order to charge that back up to run the microwave for five minutes you know to charge it back up off of the solar panels you're looking at roughly an hour or so of solar for this size of a 175 watt solar panel you're roughly you know in full sun you're looking at roughly um, an hour of charge time to run the microwave for five minutes gives you a rough bearing normally i'd have two of the solar panels hooked up and that kind of thing just to keep my batteries in good state and like i say it's one of these things where this all came out of the back of the truck if i line this up where the microwave was sitting to the front and these batteries were sitting further into the back of the unit i'd still have room to sleep over on this side <coughs> be able to run lights and everything because i could have the inverter sitting right up by my head where I have the ability to have AC wall power on the fly. And these batteries are in good state. You know, it's one of those things where I've maybe hit what? Uh, I can't even think of the math there. I've maybe hit half a percent of the battery off of that five minute microwave load. It's nothing. You know, it's one of those things where I could use this setup for years and years and years. Then there'd be no issue. And it's covert. Like I say, 
when it comes to the mount to the solar panels onto the roof and that kind of stuff that could be easy enough right but uh if you want to do kind of mobile power you know off-grid setups for cabins you know that kind of thing this level of setup is fantastic the only thing i could see potentially wanting to do is get some more additional solar panels and then potentially run those in series so i could get more overall wants and feed them into a larger solar charge controller and then that's really just to um, you know fill the batteries up at a faster rate when it comes to this side of the equation you know you've got enough to run microwaves I mean, that, that's telling within itself, right? So it's one of those things where, yes, I can run little single stove elements and those types of things, which you can get for like apartment size. They normally run about a thousand watts. So, you know, they use less power than this. Um, I, typically speaking, I would see a microwave as faster, and more efficient at using things. But I know there's some people out there just don't like to microwave everything that they're eating and that kind of stuff. But, you know, with this setup, I could easily use this for the next 10 years and if it was all the electronics were just sitting along this board or potentially this is a raised bed that I've got if I modified this subtly I could put all this stuff in underneath the bed so that it was kind of out of the way and you wouldn't even see it and just had the microwave sticking out the face here you know there's definitely a, a million and one different modifications you could do but there you have it running the microwave out of the back of a truck using solar power so and I, I just thought I'd stop and kind of throw in an additional comment now when it comes to as I'm kind of packing this stuff up and getting it back into the, you know, vehicle to take home and all that kind of happiness of uh, when it comes. So that was um, that beep was just the sound of the inverter no longer having the charge to it because I popped off the negative. Yeah, which was to be expected. But now when it comes to the capacitors that do exist in this inverter, they're still fully charged. So I'm just going to pop the positive off here. And I definitely want to make sure that the positive and negative don't touch each other at this point in time. But I just want to kind of get things back off so that my inverter is free from the battery at this point, just so I can pack it all up and go. But I wanted to kind of talk about when you're wanting to pack these things up now, and take them and go you know mobile again that's where this resistor is going to come in handy again like i say you can get uh, 20 30 watt resistors this one's just a phillips you don't have to be really heavily specific about the resistors as long as they've got the capacity and the heat sink to be able to dissipate the charge but the thinking really is now to the negative of the inverter itself i want to touch on one of those and now the other one i'm going to touch on to the positive because i want to drain the capacitors that exist in the inverter and hopefully i'm catching that on camera i know it never really gives it justice but in essence i want to turn around and touch the uh, both terminals now with the resistor of the inverter itself and if there's any charge in the capacity in the capacitor, sorry, that exists within the inverter that they're going to dissipate through this resistor and it's not going to create any sparks or shocks. The last thing you want to have is when you freshly detach from the uh, battery with your inverter, if you touch these together, if that capacitor inside the inverter was still fully charged, you get the big sparks that I was warning about earlier. Using that resistor <coughs> just allows that to not happen. So it's just kind of a, a safety way to handle the inverters. If you were dealing with an inverter, let me just pop this off. If you were dealing with an inverter that was below um, 2000 watts and 12 volts and that kind of thing, now, normally you don't have to worry about using you know, a, a resistor in that regard. And, um, there just isn't enough power that's running through that would cause big enough sparks to cause issue. But especially if you move up in a 24 volt or higher when it comes to these inverters. And if you get, even in my perspective, if you get anything above even 1500 watts, you know, you want to start using resistors to um, pre-charge your capacitors that exist within the inverter just to make sure that there is no sparks and damage. And uh, like I say, I'm just gonna pack this all up, throw it back in the truck and uh, call it a day. But like I say, hopefully you enjoyed the video.